All right, everyone, welcome. I have seven o'clock. Um, so we are excited to get started. We have a great program for you today. So my name is Caitlin McKeegan. I am an extension and master gardener. Um, and I would like to welcome you to All About Veggies, a Virginia Cooperative Extension Plant Clinic. These plant clinics are sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. These plant clinics are staffed by master gardeners from Fairfax County Master Gardeners who share science-based information about gardening and horticulture topics. So if you could go, go to the next slide, please. So our agenda today um, is, like I said, we have a great agenda. This is a perfect time of year to be talking about some of these topics as we're all getting ready to start our vegetable gardens, some for the first time, and some of us have lots of experience. Um, I'm gonna be moderating tonight's discussion and I will be joined by Extension Master Gardeners, Amanda Jackson, Tony McCara, Mary Kent, and Molly O'Boyle. So our agenda tonight, as you see on the slide, we're gonna start with bug watch. This is something new we're doing this year to kind of give you an overview of what insects you might be seeing in your garden. And then we'll hear presentations on different techniques for vegetable gardening. Tony McCara is going to discuss techniques for in-ground gardening. Mary Kent is going to discuss raised bed gardening and considerations for that practice. And then Molly O'Boyle has a presentation about container gardening. After that, we'll have an informal panel discussion. We'll take your questions um, and you know, really get all of the knowledge that our presenters today have to share so that as we go into this gardening season, we're ready to go. So I don't need to talk any longer, um, turn it over to our presenters. And our first um, is Amanda Jackson. She's also our Zoom co-host. So if you have any questions during the presentation, pop those in the chat box. Amanda's gonna be monitoring those to present to our speakers at the end of their presentation time. So Amanda, you're gonna discuss ladybugs tonight. Um, we kind of know, you know, everyone knows what a ladybug looks like, but maybe we don't really know what they look like in all their life and stages of life. So if you could tell us more about these iconic insects, we would appreciate it. Sure, um, yeah, I have a couple of interesting facts about ladybugs. There are three things that I've wanted to touch on and I only have a minute or two, so I'm gonna make this quick, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what ladybugs eat, what they look like in every stage of their life cycle, and what we can do to attract more of them to our gardens. So ladybugs really have two main food sources. They eat pollen and they eat insects. And the, uh, the latter is really what makes them so beneficial in our gardens because the bugs they like to eat are the ones that, that cause damage to our plants. Uh, they particularly prefer aphids, but they also eat scale insects, spider mites, and white flies. Um, so knowing that they're so beneficial, it's important to recognize what they look like so we can protect them when we, when we find them. And that sounds a little silly because I think most of us can identify an adult ladybug, but I think many people might not realize that ladybugs have a four-stage life cycle just like butterflies do. It starts in the spring when the adult ladybugs um, emerge from hibernation and lay eggs in clusters like you can see on the top left picture there. They tend to be they're tiny and they're sort of orange or orangey yellow. Uh, and after a few days, they hatch into the larva you can see on the top right. Um, these are pretty small, they're about quarter inch long. They have black bodies with orange or red markings on the sides. Some people compare them to tiny little alligators. Uh, and in this stage, they're extremely active. They crawl around hunting for food. And this is actually the most valuable stage of the ladybug's life cycle because when they're larvae, they'll eat um, about 200 aphids a day, which is about 10 times what they eat as adults. So uh, when you see those, you really wanna protect them. Uh, from the larva stage, after about two or three weeks, they find a fixed spot where they pupate. And uh, after about a week or two, they emerge as the adult ladybug that we all know and love. Um, so I think we can all use more ladybugs in our garden. So I did a little research to see what, if anything, we could do to attract them. And I found two uh, recommendations for things we can try. And the first is to plant the flowers that are good sources of the pollen and nectar that they like. And this is particularly helpful in early spring when the populations of the insects that they eat aren't very abundant. So I have on the right side of the slide here a list of the plants that attract ladybugs. They tend to be plants that have tiny flowers, um, things like herbs, things in the herb family like um, cilantro and dill, uh, fennel, chives. 
daisy shaped flowers like cone flowers and zinnias and then flowers that are umbrella shaped uh, like yarrow and dill. And the other recommendation I saw was to be very cautious when using pesticides because uh, most chemical pesticides will eliminate ladybug populations right along with the insects that you're trying to target. So it's better to opt for ones that are a little bit gentler like horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps. So that is my ladybug 101 in a nutshell. Thanks, Amanda. That's really great and a lot of information that maybe a lot of us didn't know or weren't aware of. So thank you so much for that quick overview. So now we're gonna move into kind of the, the big part of our presentation. We have our three presenters tonight and first up is Tony McCara. Tony's gonna to give us an overview of what you should think about if you're lucky enough to have the space to establish a vegetable garden in your yard. So Tony, welcome. We're excited to hear you have to share with us tonight. And um, like I said at the beginning, this is a perfect time of year for us to hear all this. Well, thanks a lot, Caitlin. And hi, everybody. I'm Tony McCara, and I'm a member of Fairfax County Master Gardener Association. And I'd like to say I've been doing a lifetime of gardening, but I think it's more like a lifetime of learning about gardening. But it's something I enjoy doing, and it gives me a sense of continued discovery. So what exactly is in-ground gardening? I, I think by definition, we probably have all concluded that in-ground gardening is simply planting in our existing soil at, at surface level. And this is how most large scale crops are grown for food production um, throughout the farming industry. Here are some considerations in deciding whether to go with in-ground gardening or um, some of the other choices we're going to hear about tonight. And I'll be bone honest right up front. I do all three. So I have in-ground, I have raised beds, and I, I have, um, and, and I do the container gardening too. So again, that's not to say that necessarily in-ground gardening is better. When, when you have those additional choices, but a few key points in favor of an in-ground garden and a few drawbacks should factor into our considerations. First, it provides lots of room if your decision is to grow um, a good size garden or whatever size you choose, assuming you have the room to begin with. It's likely gonna be less expensive given minimal cost of materials. And when prepared right, it allows for deep roots. Uh, Design-wise, it's easy to modify, whether enlarging or redesigning. But you do, have to, you do have lots of initial work in some tilling and soil turnover if it's a first-time garden. Plus, there is vulnerability to animal access on that surface. Other things. If it's a large garden, it might mean having to walk on the soil to do your planting and chores such as weed picking, watering and harvesting. And we'll talk about ways to get around that. And one big item, the soil of an in-ground garden is likely to take longer to warm up in the spring than the other two choices we'll be hearing about. Also, gardening basics, of course, Try to locate the garden as close as possible to a water source and be sure as much as possible that it's in full sunlight. But again, any type of gardening is a good thing and there's no such thing as the perfect ideal one size fits all approach. So with any, as with any endeavor, with anything worthwhile, there's always gonna be some work, especially for the first time garden. And a lot of it is gonna depend on what you're given to start with. The uh, beginning efforts are gonna be focused on getting the garden soil into shape. And looking at these photos, we could be dealing with hard, compact soil, just, just the devil of the soil, or we might have to remove well-established turf. And um, either way, we're gonna be working in lots of compost. If we have to break up the soil, that is going to require initial tilling or digging. And I'll address that further on a subsequent slide. In other cases, we may be starting with relatively good soil, so we'd be that much further ahead. As for transforming a grass surface to garden growing, 
there, there's always the option of digging out the turf, but, and there's also um, the choice of skimming the grass to its lowest level and using what we call sheet composting, which is laying down then some cardboard and several sheets of newspaper to serve as weed suppressants. And these are all going to be covered with loose garden soil on top and compost and mulch. And the paper is going to deteriorate over time when, when we add these items. So when the soil has been worked so that it's at the stage for planting, definitely test the soil. So you're going to, if you ever tune into any of our sessions, you're always going to hear, you have to have a soil test. And the reason for that is you want to have the right balance of macronutrients and micronutrients that's indicated by the soil, by a pH. The, most vegetable plants will thrive in soils with pH readings of 6.2 to 6.8 or slightly acidic soil. If, if your soil tests below this range, fertilizer and nutrients needed by the plant get locked up in the soil and can't get to the plant. So, but the right amount of lime will get us to the right pH if, if it is uh, definitely off. Another important point is if you're digging, you know, make sure that it's not in the vicinity of underground utility lines. So we've all read the stories about that and we don't wanna be a statistic. So have the utility, um, this utility, I believe it is, come out and mark your ground for you so that you're sure. So when getting started, expect to do some work depending on the conditions and past uses of the turf or the past uses of the land, I'm sorry. In successive seasons, things are gonna get easier. There's gonna be less work, but we're going to still need to work at make the, making the soil work for us. We don't want to aggressively till or turn over the soil year after year or, or even more frequently, but rather as much as possible, let it intact and try to build it up over time with compost and mulch. This builds up beneficial microbes that live in the soil, including bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa, and earthworms. And just remember that good soil takes time. It's, I guess you could say, uh, you know, good wine takes time, well, good soil takes time too. Now, talking about tilling, many experts, and I'm sure that a lot of my master gardener compadres will agree with me that continuous tilling and digging of the soil is no longer seen as a best practice for promoting soil that's good for our plants or for the environment for that matter. Still, many gardeners with in-ground beds consider tilling a regular ritual in spring and fall. And as um, one of our instructors, Lee Reich told us in class, a lot, he thinks a lot of people do it just to feel good because it really doesn't do too much else for the soil and it might be harming it. We, we wouldn't think it, but the continuous pulverization of soil, reducing it to smaller and smaller particles can actually close up soil pores that would otherwise allow the access of water and oxygen and other, nu another, other nutrients which the roots need to grow. And when these soil pores close up, that leads to surface blockage, such as depicted in that image on the left uh, with that cracked dry soil that looks like alligator skin. And this in turn could lead to wind erosion and rainfall runoff of fine sediment, which is a major source of pollution in our lakes and streams. And if, if, if there's that runoff, it often carries with it nitrogen and phosphorus leading to eutrophication or dense growth of plant life and death of animal life from lack of oxygen into the waterways. On top of this, such constant soil disturbance severely diminishes the critically needed microbial activity that we addressed in the previous slide. And if, and if that isn't enough, continuous tilling at the same depth 
creates a compacted soil layer below the soil surface. So continually adding organic matter to our soil while reducing regular tillage and soil digging, um, if not eliminating them completely, is, is the way to go. More organic matter in the top four inches that we're going to be adding over time means increased soil stability, less nutrient leaching, uh, less soil erosion, compaction, and improved drainage, water infiltration, and biological diversity. The other thing we want to do, and this is a, a fun thing to do in the winter time, or or even in a, as a mid-season um, evaluation of your garden, is take time to visualize the garden, and you know now is a good time to do that. Here are two in-ground gardens, and if I look at them, they're both picture perfect. But note that the one on the left didn't allow for any accessibility or they didn't build any paths throughout the garden, which means that getting to the vegetables will require walking on the soil and will certainly be more of a challenge to water at the bottom of the plant like we recommend or fertilize, pull weeds and ultimately harvest. The, the other thing is when I look at some of these plants, I mean, they're, I don't think they're in the fully mature stage yet. So when all of these plants do grow to full maturity, it's going to be even, I, I, you're probably not going to see any soil at all in, in the picture. But looking at the one on the right, you'll see that it is so much better organized. It's, it's navigable. That's the main thing. And it's more compartmentalized to allow for easier access and even easier planning for where and when to put your plants. It, it helps in our succession planting. It, it constantly gives us an eye of what's going and what's going to go. And the planning is just so much easier when we plan the garden to make it work for us. Now, the slide is a little tongue in cheek. I only put this in here because some plants may be more suitable for in-ground gardening, but that's not to say they couldn't grow in containers or in, in the right size um, raised beds. But for instance, if I had a two foot high raised bed, I don't think I'd want to grow pole beans on top of that without investing in a stepladder and keeping it handy. Um, they, they grow tall enough, you know, the reach is enough. Zucchini, as we all know, is a space hog. So, you know, that could easily overtake uh, part of the garden with, you know, whether it's in ground or not planned properly or, or, or raised bed or otherwise. And again, I'm not here to say that any of these should not be planted through those alternate means, but, but just again, consider this as part of the planning and realize that plants have different cultivars and read the description of the plant that you're putting in before, before you plant it. And one of the fun things about in-ground gardening is a new concept called foodscaping. And what that is, as most of us in Master Gardeners know, is that it's landscaping with the addition of edibles in your existing ornamentals. So your shrubbery, your flower beds uh, and around the house. Many homes have foundational shrubbery or flowers. And in a lot of cases, the soil that they're growing in is, is been taken care of quite nicely. And it just, you know, if there's extra space, why not put in some kale or some um, colored chard or parsley or root crops or a small determinate tomato. Another advantage is that these crops are probably, uh, could be most likely closer to the house and therefore more convenient to take care of them. So something to think about and the list is limited only by our imagination. So that brings me to the end and uh, more information can be found at uh, these sites right here. And um, 
and we'll close out with some of the references that I used. And so at this point, I'll hand it back over to my colleague. Thanks so much, Tony. That was a really great overview. Um, really appreciate all of that context and some thoughtful things that we can all think about as we're planning our gardens. So uh, next we are joined by Mary Kent and she's here to introduce us to another method of gardening that we might be familiar with, which is raised bed gardening. Um, we see this technique used a lot in community gardens and many of us you know, use it for space considerations in our home vegetable garden. So uh, Mary, I'll turn it over to you for some more information. What I want to talk about today is a little bit about me, which very little, a little bit about why raised beds and Tony covered a lot of the topics that I was going to talk about. So I'm, you may hear me repeating some of the best things that Tony said because I agree fully. And then I'll talk about how to build a little bit and how to maintain your raised beds. Again, some of this may sound like you just heard it, which is good gardening, regardless of what you grow your plants in, good gardening habits and good gardening is universal regardless. So, okay, why I switched to raised beds? Well, I've been gardening like Tony my whole life and we won't tell you how many years that is, but I grew up on a farm, so you can imagine that. But it was in Wisconsin and we had this gorgeous black loam soil. And then we moved out here where um, it's red. Now I had never seen red soil before, but that's what we have here and they call it clay. And it is rock solid clay. So when I went to garden, I discovered that I really couldn't grow the variety and the quantity of plants that I wanted to grow. In addition to the clay, I also have a limited space or a limited space I wanted to give up and only six or seven hours of sun. Given clay, everything I read and researched said you got to add all sorts of grass, mulch, leaves, organic humus, all these things have to be added, which I did. So I tilled that stuff in and I wasn't a master gardener. I had just come out of the Midwest where you can grow anything and anything. I tilled it in, I did lots of work. I made a mess of the place. Turns out I was destroying the soil and needless to say, my soil never got any better. I, <laughs> my tomatoes were just like they were the first year after 15 years of this. So I decided there must be a better way. And indeed there was. I, at that point, I had joined the master gardening and I was hearing all about the raving about raised beds. I did a little research and discovered that that indeed would solve my problems. I didn't have to till all the time. I could use the soil that I put in and it looked a lot like that black loam that I was familiar with from out in the Midwest. It didn't look at all like that red stuff that I had in my yard. And so the best things about raised beds are, or also quick facts, are that it builds better soil structure and drainage compared to ground level gardening. Why is it better soil structure? For one thing, you, you never till it or you minimally till it and you put in your own soil. So you can dilute the thickness of the clay soils. And if you have sandy soils, it's also a problem with growing and the, adding the comp, the compost and topsoil that you will purchase just makes a big difference. And as Tony said, the beds warm up earlier in the spring, but there's a caveat there. If you put a lot of mulch, if you have them mulched heavily or you have a, a cover crop on there, they will still stay cool in the spring, just as if they were in ground beds. But the second thing that's really nice about raised garden, raised beds is that you can put down soil, uh, what do you call them? Weed barriers. You put this right on top of the soil, I use cardboard, multiple layers of newspaper also work. If you put down cardboard, one or two layers of cardboard and then put your soil on top of it in the beds or your mulch for the paths, the weeds just have a very difficult time. In fact, my weeds only grow up right at the edge of the beds between where the mulch and the beds meet. They can sort of get a little foothold in there. And there's multiple kinds of raised beds. So depending on what your environment is, you can have raised ground beds, which is what what I have, you could have supported raised beds or you could have container raised beds. Um, this one showing in this picture is a raised ground bed, but it's multiple layers and looks really neat. Whether you put it in your side yard or your front yard, it just looks very aesthetically pleasing. So those are the highlights of raised beds and that's why I was addicted. So where now, now you decide you're gonna do raised beds. Well, how do you go about doing it? Well. This slide is basically the same slide you would have if you were going to locate any garden. It's where do you 
where do you have enough sun? Where do you have a well-drained site that's relatively level? Where can you build a fence? Because there are few areas in this area that have that don't have deer, rabbit, and groundhog problems. In fact, many areas you have all three. So you really need a fence. Otherwise, you're not that you will have a very well-fed wildlife population. And the last thing, or maybe this is the first thing, where is the con is your bed going to be? Is it convenient to you? Is it convenient to watering? Is it, you just need to be able to see it all the time. So you can see when it needs to be watered. You can see if you suddenly have some insect or disease problems. And if you hide it miles away or you know around the back of your house, you may not go and use it as much as you would normally do. So the more convenient it is, the more likely you are to use it. So now that you've decided where your garden is gonna be, then you get to look at how to, how to build the, the beds and what's the layout and how do you decide where, what's a good, what should the, the beds look like? Well, there's no wrong answer. They can be round, they can look like a pyramid, they can be square, they can be long, but there are a couple things you need to keep in mind. The length, it's up to you, but you're going to be walking around it. So if you build a 20 foot long bed, you're going to constantly be walking all the way around that bed because you don't wanna walk in the middle. So you might find it's smarter to build two nine foot beds and then have a narrow walkway through the middle. Wouldn't call it a path because it's gonna to be too narrow for that, but it'll be small enough, big, the path will be big enough for you to walk through so you don't have to keep walking around that 20 foot bed. Um, the width, same thing goes to width. You need to be able to reach to the middle and that goes for in-ground rows too. You don't wanna make your row so wide that you have to walk on it to reach what's in the middle. If you put beets or lettuce in the middle and you can't reach them, that's very frustrating. The height, most raised beds are between six, eight, 12 inches high, which is great. Plants usually need at least eight to 12 inches to do well. So if you make them um, deeper than that, you have other things to worry about. 12, because plants don't need 24 inches of soil to grow. If you make it that deep, you have other concerns you need to be aware of, drainage concerns, uh, compaction concerns, just many, many more issues you need to deal with. So my recommendation is to keep them in the eight to 12 inch depth. That's also the width of boards. If you buy two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by twelves, that's the standard size of your boards too. And we talked about the paths earlier, two to three foot wide is far and away the best, best width. And how, how I know that you shouldn't go narrower is a lesson I learned myself. I was, in fact, I was designing this bed that you, these got beds that you see in the pictures and I was designing it on a piece of graph paper and you know, you draw a line with a pencil, there's no width to that pencil. So I had it all scoped out, how wide the beds would be, how wide the aisles would be. I get to the garden and I start measuring it out and it didn't fit anymore. And somebody said, no construction. <laughs> you know, did you take into consideration that your boards are one and three quarters to two inches wide? And I was like, oh my, that times six is the foot. I can't figure out where it went to. And so my, some of my paths are now 18 inches wide instead of two foot wide, which was like, oh, lesson learned. Make sure you account for the fact that the boards are wide too. Um, okay, so now you've got your boards and we assume that you'll go somewhere, or I assume you'll go somewhere and read about how to build them and nail and all that kind of stuff. But I'll talk to about an option alternative to that in a minute. So you've got your beds built, then what do you do? You put down that weed barrier. So you put down cardboard or multiple layers, like I said earlier, to act as a weed barrier, put it down in the beds themselves, put it down in the, on your paths and walkways. Then you add fill. And the fill, my feeling is a 70 to 30 mix of compost and soil. So if I've got a 12 inch bed, I put a thin layer of mulch down on top of the newspaper and cardboard. Then I put a little thicker layer of topsoil down. And then I put some more mulch down. Then I put some more topsoil. And then I put some compost at the top. So it's basically a sandwich. Uh, and that way you, you just, it automatically mixes itself over time. And as Tony said, you have to do a soil test. I find testing the topsoil is the best way to do. So I'll stick my shovel in multiple places in the topsoil that I've got, usually buy it bulk, 
and then take that sample and send it off to the tech labs. What I've found in the four beds that I've worked on buying good quality topsoil is that it's very alkaline. I get pHs in the 7.4, 7.5, 7, 6 ranges. And um, plants don't like it that high. So I end up with a lot of um, buying a lot of acidifier, soil acidifier to add to the soil. And I'll talk about the first year issues in a minute. But that first year is when you're going to want to get your soil back down to where the garden plants like it. Again, talked about the top level. Get, make sure you get your organic uh, materials on the top of that. It protects the soil, protects, and it starts the whole process of the beneficial insects and fungi and bacteria working in your soil because topsoil is great. It looks great. You pay a nice price for it, but it is raw. And I know raw is not a scientific term, but it's raw. Nothing is growing in there. It's, it's fluffy. It's, it's just raw, not science, but raw. Okay, this is an option I told you about. Um, you can buy these planter wall blocks at all the big stores and they can just go together. I'm not gonna spend any time on it. Okay, this was my garden. You can see that my beds, they're all filled up and fluffy. And what's gonna happen is that the soil will compact and the first year you're not going to get to grow much. So a recommendation is if you've got a large area, you might wanna put in two beds in the first year, keep the other beds in ground the way it is. Then the second year, you'd put in more raised beds and that sort of mitigates the first year disappointment because your soil is just not ready. And you can see my potatoes growing in my containers in my mulched paths and the deer fence is starting up there to go. Okay, maintaining your beds, there is not anything new here. It's just like gardening. Plan for how you're gonna water, plan that you're going to have to water and plan to put mulch on. And the next one is fertilize appropriately. You don't have to over fertilize, put cover crops on. I show a picture of buckwheat and peas here. Just some ideas that would help. And this is a garden that is in bow white and the bed, the picture on the right was those beds were put in the last day before COVID hit in March of 2020. And that year we filled it up with soil and it basically sat feral. We put in watermelons. But the next year you can see how with all the beneficial insects and organisms growing, the, the spring plants, the beets and the other uh, greens that are down there, that's the spring of the second year. And by then it was really great. So I think, Here's some raised beds mistakes. I've talked about every one of them except the bottom one. Make sure you don't use pressure treated lumber. The rest of we already talked about, I don't wanna go over them again, but watch out for pressure treated lumber. That is just a no-no because of the chemicals. And some references for you to look at that have more information on how to build and use a garden because I just touched the surface. So Caitlin, back to you. Thank you so much, Mary. And I know there is so much to talk about and you know, cramming all of this information into an hour is a challenge in and of itself. But uh, thank you for that great overview. Next, we're gonna go to Molly O'Boyle and she's gonna talk about container gardening. So, um, you know, Mary and Tony talked about great in-ground techniques. Some of us may not have the space, some of us may not have the energy to go big with these in-ground gardens or raised bed gardens. So container gardening might be a good option for us to kind of dip our toes into this practice if you're brand new or you know, utilize space like a patio, a balcony, a porch, a walkway, things like that. So I don't wanna get ahead of Molly, but um, Molly, take it away. Tell us about how to grow things in containers. Great, thanks so much, Caitlin. Um, sorry, it looks like I'm in a cave here, but the light is right over my head. So I'd, I'd rather not have it on. Um, I've been a master gardener for 12 years. I live in Reston and have had a garden plot for 28 years, and I'm really not that old, but um, I've been doing a lot of vegetable gardening and also obviously at my house. Um, the one thing about container gardening is it does, uh, we all been talking about vegetable gardens and stuff, but it doesn't have to just be vegetables that you work on in containers. My front porch has turned into a uh, mis mix and a mix up of all kinds of different pots and I just keep expanding. And thank goodness my husband doesn't uh, comment on that. Okay, so I wanted to go over a couple of things and I'll try to, I'll try not to talk too fast, but I tend to do that. 
So one of the reasons people are starting to do container gardenings is it does take less time to get started. Many people in Reston and in, or getting condos, doesn't have to be Reston, obviously, less time to get started in this. You don't need a lot of space. Lawns are shrinking though. The people who have lawns, they don't wanna be mowing lawns. And uh, so they're buying homes with smaller um, property, basically. It is a low maintenance thing. And if that's a priority for people, then that's a, containers are a great way to do it. You can work with small plants as, um, as Tony said, you don't want corn growing in a, a 12 inch pot, a 12 inch tall pot on your porch. So you might wanna stick with a smaller variety. There also is no digging in the ground with both what Mary and Tony said. So again, if you can get the ingredients in your, around you, you don't have to dig. In addition, you can still plant pollinators. A lot of people, it's becoming a, obviously a social responsibility to go out and be concerned about our pollinators. So this is a good way to do it with flowers. Most vegetables also have flowers and they help the pollinators as well. In addition, if it's on your deck or porch, it might just be your own oasis and that's an awesome thing. So as you're getting started, don't be intimidated. You do have to, just like Mary said, you got to start small sometimes. You don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, don't be intimidated, but don't overwhelm yourself either. You do want to set some narrow goals for yourself. If money is an issue initially, how much can you afford in supplies? How much space do you want to use? My back deck used to have no plants and now it's on, they're on the railing, they're on stands, they're stacked up, starting to take over. But that's what happens when you like plants. You gotta consider if you do wanna do vegetables, what kind do you wanna do? Are they gonna fit in a pot? Are they gonna tip over if it's windy? What kind of flowers are they gonna to get too tall? You have to, are they gonna be a problem for your neighbors? They don't wanna see all your vegetables growing in pots on your porch. I mean, who knows? And what results do you want at the end of the year? One year, about three years ago, I, I got some coleus plants and I thought, oh my gosh, these are gonna be so beautiful. They end up being four feet tall, which was great but you couldn't see over them. So next year I didn't do so many. All right. When you do get strategies or get started, you gotta think of strategies that you're gonna use. All of what Tony and Mary said, how much sun do you have? For example, my porch, I didn't think I could ever grow anything there because I get less than six hours. It's best to have six hours and that may be why my plants were four feet tall. They were stretching a bit. Um, I get about four and a half to five. Make sure your water source is close because you don't want to be hauling that hose back and forth all the time. And you don't want to have to carry um, heavy watering cans if you don't have to. Right plant, right, right location. Very important, always important in um, gardening. And again, you got to consider your costs. Oh, and in addition, think of succession. If you have plants in the spring, like let's say you do want to mix um, spring greens with flowering annuals. You can do that, but you wanna plan ahead a little, make sure they'll all fit. And as always, consider that sun. So when you're considering your site, is it gonna be at the ground level like a patio? Is the water source close by? What surface are you on? Um, many people I know put their pots on driveways. A little issue you have there is it does get a little warmer than a concrete porch or a stoop or a wooden deck. Is it a stone um, area, a stone patio? Also can get hot. Water might stay on it longer. Is it wood? Are you gonna have drainage through your, through your, uh, the slats of your deck or is water gonna just run off and make it a mess for you? And always deer. Never forget the deer. If it is a raised deck, or balcony, what do you consider there? Is if, if your water's, if your uh, spigot is downstairs below, are you gonna, do you mind or does your spouse mind having a hose come up from the bottom and just kind of lounge around on your deck? You might wanna consider, is there a weight limit for your deck? If, is it older? Because if it's an older deck, you might have an issue with big pots with soil soaking wet. You might wanna consider that. So think about that. Oh my gosh, you can do hanging plants. You can do hanging pots. You can put them off of your deck railing as long as your um, squirrels don't get into them or who, whatever kind of critter. But oh, hanging pots are just so beautiful. You do have 
other critters being, of course, squirrels, chipmunks, and the sun, the um, the deer, etc. But think about think about if you are going to be doing um, vegetables, you might have a percentage of your vegetables for the critters. So now, when we talked about um, the soil fertilizing, you're not fertilizing the soil; you're fertilizing the life in the soil. And life in the soil could be whatever micro and macro um, things in there. You want to have it in there for as long as possible and not just drench out when you water. So think about slow time, slow time to release fertilizer. Um, you can, if you want an organic soil or an organic fertilizer, they do have slow release organic fertilizers in there. You can also mix some in a spray bottle and spray it on your leaves, which also helps with maintaining healthy plants. So again, what are we gonna do? Where are we starting here? Choose the potting soil, choose the containers, choose your plants. Then you got flowers. Are you doing vegetables? Consider their size. Are they small or large? So many things to think about. And when you go to places like Maryfield or Home Depot or Metal Art Gardens or any garden center, there are so many varieties out there. It's hard to think about which one is gonna be best for you. One year, I took four different kinds and tried all different kinds to see what would be the best one. Um, I do believe Happy Frog was a good one. Here's some others that you might be able to have either as a soil starter or to add into your soil to retain moisture. And you don't want them to dry out because your plants will not be healthy and survive. This coir mix that says grow it on it is coconut, coconut um, uh, husks, and it does help retain water. Got some things you can mix in here. Oh my gosh, make sure you have a drainage hole. This is gonna be something you do not want water to sit at the bottom of your pot. If you don't have a drainage hole, just go ahead and make one. We also want to let you know that um, there has been, there have been people who say mix in things at the bottom of your pot so that it doesn't stay wet down there. Well, by doing that, your roots are, are not getting the full space that they need. So it may help with drainage, but it does not help your plants. So my suggestion, do not add items to the bottom of your pots, no matter what uh, you feel like. I'm gonna speed things up a little. I'm gonna just cruise through some photos. So here's some options of um, getting some vertical things going in your yard, side of your house. If you have an extra thing hanging around that you wanna just try out, go ahead and do it and see what happens. These, um, the ones with the, the pallets, fantastic use. You can actually buy those things at all garden centers now, the hooks to do that. I have a, a container like this on the left with my herbs in it. You can use any kind of container, oh my gosh. Great idea for kids to get out there and try new things. Grocery bags that you think are on their last leg. Make a few holes at the bottom and try those. Very, very easy to move around. Here's some very interesting um, things. Oh, look at this Ikea bags. You all, we all know how big those are. Here's our, some alternatives. There are a couple of very fun things here. You can use Crocs. I think that's hilarious. Or if you got an old, cool thing. There you go. Give it a shot. See what your kids think. Get them involved. If you want to go whole hog out there, look at what you can do with pallets. Stack them up, have good drainage, all different types of things, all different heights. As long as you have good sun, good drainage, you don't mind the water, um, bringing the water out to it. You can group things on balconies. I think this is fantastic. Instead of flowers or with flowers, put some greens out there. You can also put some peppers that aren't gonna to get too tall. Tony mentioned dwarf uh, plants. Fantastic way to get started in your garden on a balcony. You can try all different things. As you can see here, bok choy with flowers. Perfect mix. Pull out the bok choy when it's ready, add something else. You can also put some trellises up so you can grow some beans. Maybe not ever growing beans, but you can put up bean plants that will vine um, maybe to four feet tall. And again, container with support, fantastic way to beautify your backyard, 
all different kinds of options for how you want to grow plants in containers. You got to make sure you have the sun. As Mary said, if you have good pH, you're going to have great soil. You, oh, by the way, you do not have to plant one thing per pot. Here you can see the different kinds of herbs. If you're going to keep, if you are going to keep um, trimming back plants, put as many as you want into a, especially herbs, into a container so you get the, the most out of your, out of your space and your season. I think that's about it. And I, I, if you, if you want to try, I say go for it. Start small, expand, talk to your neighbors, talk to other master gardeners, and you will really, really enjoy planting in containers. Thanks so much. Some of my sources here also. Because you guys have provided so much information. This is absolutely wonderful. I loved all of the creative ways that you can use different containers. I never thought about shopping bags. That's such a great idea. And you're right, they are easy to move around. Um, so our three panelists, uh, Tony, Mary, and Molly, we'd love to ans ask a couple questions for you. Um, and Amanda, is there anything in the chat before we get started? I just have a couple things for each of you. Uh, we do have a couple of things in the chat. Um, and I know Mary's a little time constraint. So let me start with Mary. There was, uh, you, you mentioned that you had put a deer fence around your garden. And there's a, a question in the chat box about how high the fence needs to be. Well, it depends on how much pressure you have from deer. I live next to a county park. We get herds six, eight deer going through our yard on a regular basis, like daily. So I have a double deer fence. I have an outside one that's 10 foot high and then four feet inside that I have one that's four feet high. Um, that's probably overkill for most people, but it's the only way I can save my potatoes and, and my tomatoes and my anything because they are always hungry. And that's just the nature is hungry. I'm hungry. So that's what I have to do. Many people can get by with a six foot fence. Um, I find fences that you can take down every year work for me. So I have permanent posts, but then I use a, a heavy duty net around the outside. So it has a little more body to it. It doesn't, insects don't get caught into it and snakes and frogs don't get caught in it, but it does keep the deer out. Uh, so the question is, Bree Arthur recommends a, a type of potting soil for containers. Does anyone know of a substitute that's available here in Virginia? I use the happy frog that Molly talked about. I find that I don't use it straight up. I usually mix it a little bit with some of the cheaper items um, just because um, I dump my potting, the plants that are in containers, which are my shopping bags full for potatoes, et cetera. I dump it into my garden beds at the end of the year and it makes finding potatoes much easier when you just dump it onto the other soil. So I use a happy frog and mix it with some of the um, organic potting soils, outdoor potting soils, not indoor potting soils. I found that I can't go wrong with uh, the ProMix products and I, I've used them generously over the years. I would agree with Tony, I do that. I, I definitely use the Coyer, but it's, it's, it's a single um, product, it's not a mix, um, but definitely it needs to be mixed in with other media. So Mary, I'm gonna direct this first question to you. As some of us are getting started out, this might be intimidating. It might seem like there's a lot we have to sink into this. It's gonna be labor intensive, resource intensive. Um, is there any, if you have to give one piece of advice to someone who's starting out, no idea what they're doing, what would you give? Well, the first thing is, I guess there's three pieces to this. Locate your garden in a good place. If you don't put it in a good place, no matter how much work you put into it, if it doesn't get enough sun, it's not gonna grow. The second one is look at your animals, wildlife predators or, or companions, if you will, and see, how many there are. And if you got that under control, then I would personally go with raised beds. I'd put that cardboard down. I'd, then I'd mix the soil and topsoil and mulch on top of a raised bed. But realize the first year is not gonna be great, but I'm done digging up my lawn. You just start building on top of it. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot of construction. Go to the Home Depots and the big boxes and buy those planter blocks, put in a two by four, and with cardboard and some soil on top, you can do the, the lettuces the first year, at the end of the first year when your soil's better. Okay. That's what I would do, start small, get used to it, but the location, location, location. Tony, we'll ask you the same question. Any 
What's your one piece of advice for new gardeners, new vegetable gardeners, I should say? Well, for the brand new gardener who has boundless enthusiasm, I would say <clears throat> start small. You know, don't don't um, commit yourself to something that you know you may not be able to see through the long haul just because it gets overwhelming because it is a long haul. And um, and I guess one other thing I would say is don't don't start too soon. You know, you know we all get tempted with this warm weather like today. I mean, you know, but last year. I think it was the 9th of May, we had temperatures 39 degrees. So, so there's no real benefit in, in jumping the gun and being the first out of the, out, out of the shoot. So, so give nature time and you know, nature, there's plenty of garden time, you know, well into September or early October. But Tony, what if you have seedlings ready to go? You gotta get them out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, <laughs> so for all of the people who started tomato seeds in February and who bought them at Walmart in the eighth of March, you know, it's like, well, see, uh, hold back, hold back. But I, you know, if if you find that you did overgrow some. Um, some tomato plants and eggplants and peppers. Uh, just do the best, baby them right now. Um, you know, if, if you have them outside hardening off, bring them in at night if the temperatures are gonna get down. I mean, you don't want them to have stunted growth as a result of all of the temperature shift. Thanks, Tony. Um, Mary, or I'm sorry, Molly, we'll, we'll ask you the same question. What's your one go-to piece of advice for people who are new to this? I'll tell you, I being in the community garden uh, scene for as long as I have, a lot of people come in and think they're going to be doing a bazillion things at one time. And they just have to realize that physically they have to budget their time. I mean, people have other conflicts in their life, like eating their own, their food and feeding their family and work. So you really have to consider how much time you have to allot to it this year also. So as you get started and you realize at the beginning of the season, you may not have as much time, just limit the exposure. Like they've said, start a little smaller um, and then just keep tacking on. You can, you can plant vegetables all the way into August and September, depending on what you're growing. So you just have to be patient and read up on a lot of things. Well, and that leads me into my next question. So you guys have a lot of experience, very skilled gardeners. I think Tony alluded to this, that he's always learning. Um, so if some of us are enthusiastic or maybe bite off more that we can chew or, you know, our gardens don't achieve the success that we want that first year, does that mean we did something wrong or is that a lesson that we can all take? So Molly, since you just started, I'll start with you. Um, and we'll kind of go back through the group, but. Oh my gosh. Okay. So every year it's a learning experience because you don't know when the heavy rains are coming. Okay. How do you, how do you handle that? You don't know when the cool temps are coming. You don't know if it's going to, we're going to have 60 inches of rain in June and July. You don't know if it's, if the temperatures are going to stay hundred degrees for 18 days in a row. So you have to constantly be flexible with what you're doing and analyze what you're doing. And definitely every year is different. So you can't use one year as an example of your success or not. That's my thoughts. That's great advice. So um, Mary, we're about to lose you. So I'll let you take the next shot at this question. Just, you know, if, if we mess something up, if plants die, oh. if things don't go the way we want it to. Okay. I agree with Molly. It's be flexible because nothing always works. I mean, I my philosophy is the animals get, oh, a fourth. If I get at least a half out of my garden, I feel really lucky because that's more food than I and my, my, that I and my husband can eat. And my neighbors sometimes get a little tired of me too. So I plan on certain, <laughs> not particular things failing, failing, but I plan on not everything that I grow plant will be a success. It just never is. And so I don't call that a failure. I call, like Molly said, a learning. And next year I may not plant that variety, or I may, may plant later, or I may call that the fourth that nature gets. That's also great advice. All right, so Tony, um, I think this is all we have time for, so I'll let you close out our question panel here with um, your advice for those of us who might suffer some failures this season. Just learn from your mistakes, embrace those mistakes. I, I remember Adrian Higgins, who um, 
was the editor of the Washington Post gardening section, uh, gave us a class several years ago. And I, and I remember his quote, he said, if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. So make mistakes, learn from them, keep good notes, keep a journal. And what a fun thing to do. And you'll know, you'll know, it'll grow on you. And um, it, you'll, you'll know what to switch, change around, uh, modify, whatever. And so that's my thought. If I could just tag on, I keep a journal on my phone. So when I'm in the garden, I can just say, start talking and say, I did this today. I planted these varieties in this order. And then you can remember what you've done because you go home and you forget. Or you walk in the door and you forget. Well, I want to thank all of you for your time for these great presentations. I know we only scratched the surface of, of these subjects and um, we could talk about this literally for hours. And I think many of us would really enjoy that. But I just want to thank you for your time, for this great information. And this session is recorded. So if you're like, like Molly just said, sometimes you forget things that we just heard, refer to it often. Um, and I just want to thank you all for this, this great presentation. We're not quite done yet, but we're saying goodbye to our presenters. So we have a little bit more information to share just as we close out here tonight. Um, and this, our presenters gave this great segue. I promise we didn't ask them to script this, but um, they mentioned the practice of garden journaling. And this might be helpful for you as you grow and maintain your garden this year. So journaling can help track what works, what doesn't, um, what bugs you might see in your garden. So you'll see that we kind of you know, hit on all these points in today's presentation. You can track growing patterns, weather patterns, or diseases or insect damage your plants may experience. So you can watch for those seasonally in the coming years. And uh, we are encouraging all participants in these clinics to try out a gardening journal. And some examples, uh, we'll post some of those in the chat. And then at our last virtual clinic of the season, we'll review these journals together and we'll put our gardens to bed and we'll start planning for 2023. And these journals will be really helpful for us. To register for future sessions, um, and to find additional resources, including great articles, weed profiles, and more resources, you can visit fairfaxgardening.org. And you can check our calendar to see monthly postings of monthly topics um, and future topics we'll be covering in these clinics. So we've been hosting these plant clinics since the summer of 2020. All have been recorded and they're available on our BCE Fairfax County YouTube site. In addition to the virtual plant clinic presentations, you can see the six presentations from our fall 2020 Lunch and Lawn series, our 2021 spring lunch and lawn series and our zone seven garden series. There is a ton of information. So, you know, please check this out if you have some time and are, are interested in digging in deeper on some of these topics. So I wanna thank you all for attending. This has been a great session. I hope you really enjoyed it. I appreciate seeing so many of you um, for our inaugural veg vegetable virtual plant clinic. Um, if you have any future questions, you can reach out to Adria Bordas. She's our extension agent. I hope we'll see you um, in two weeks on Tuesday night. And uh, I hope you'll continue to attend our programs throughout the season. We just have a great program uh, planned for you and we'll you know, continue these through October. So thank you so much. Have a great night. We really appreciate having you here.